forensic science is by definition at the crossroads of science and law. However, one should keep in mind as a forensic scientist that you are not a lawyer. You need to be aware of the ways in which the law impacts on you, but you should not overstep the boundaries of your expertise. You are in the first place a scientist. One of the pitfalls for a forensic scientist is to be associated with one of the parties in a legal argument. Unfortunately, we very often see that forensic scientists work for the police and by definition they are then working for law enforcement. And law enforcement has a really important purpose in life, but the accused also has the right to be uh, innocent until proven guilty. And in that sense, the forensic scientist should not be drawn into a law enforcement role. The forensic scientist should remain objective and decide uh, what science is about the claims by the competing parties. Having noted that a forensic scientist should not be a legal expert, the forensic scientist should be aware of any restrictions that are imposed by law on the activities of a forensic scientist. The law may, for example, require a forensic scientist to be registered via some formal process as a forensic scientist in order to practice forensic science. Forensic scientists also often encounter things that are not available to the general public. Uh, in some branches of forensic science, the scientists work with human tissue and there may be legislation that prescribe exactly how human tissue should be handled. In digital forensics, we very often deal with information and there is a host of privacy laws that one has to adhere to. In general, one doesn't have a blanket permission to access information simply because you are a digital forensic scientist. In fact, there are some very specific cases. Consider, for example, legal privilege. The communication between a legal practitioner, a lawyer, and the client of that lawyer is privileged. And no one apart from the lawyer and the client, is supposed to have access to that information. In this course, where we are talking about documents, one should have the ability to avoid such privileged documents. It is not only a professional requirement, it is a legal requirement. In this course, we will encounter a couple of legal systems, or legal contexts, where the context may have an impact on how you practice forensic science. The key remains that you should always practice forensic science as a scientific search for truth. However, the specific way in which you do it may be impacted by these systems and contexts. The first example of system differences that we will talk about are the differences between so-called adversarial systems and inquisitorial systems. In an adversarial system, as the name indicates, the two parties to a case fight with one another in order to win the case. In an inquisitorial system, the judge or the presiding officer will ask questions, uh, will probe facts uh, or will request facts from the people involved in the case and will in that way determine who wins the case. It should be pointed out that adversarial systems are used in about 25% of the world while inquisitorial systems are used in about 75% of the world. However, because adversarial systems are typically depicted in Hollywood movies and US TV series, many of us are more familiar with the notion of an adversarial system if our primary source of legal systems 
is uh, the movie theater or the TV. An adversarial system, as already noted, is one where the parties to a case or to a legal dispute fight with one another. One way to think about it is to think about a contest such as a boxing match or a debating competition. So the various parties are putting in their best effort to win and the role that the judge plays is in essence that of an umpire. So the judge will ensure that these players do not make any illegal moves, that they play according to the rules, and that they stay within the limits of what are prescribed by the law. In some cases, the judge also plays the role of referee where the judge in the end decides who wins the game or who wins the legal competition. The challenge for a forensic scientist in this context is that the forensic scientist is appointed by one of the parties to this dispute. So you as a forensic scientist work for the one party or the other party. And then there is a very high likelihood that they may try and draw you into saying what this side wants you to say. And of course you should, as we said previously, remain true to science. You should not change your response based on the side that you are representing. You should let the science speak for itself. So in principle, the scientists on both sides of this competition should say exactly the same thing. However, uh, it is also true that you as a forensic scientist may be attacked on various grounds because of what you are saying. The other side may want to discredit you so that the parts that you have emphasized may, deem, may be deemed less useful than whatever their forensic scientist will say. Uh, this is unfortunate, it should not happen, but in real life it does. In an inquisitorial system, as I indicated just now, the presiding officer will ask questions. So the presiding officer may decide what knowledge is required to decide the case, and then will start asking questions of the various parties and the judge will therefore be a very active participant in proceedings. Judge sets priorities, and the judge may also appoint a forensic scientist to shed light on a certain matter where this forensic science is not working for the one part or the other part, but working for the court. Clearly, this is a more appropriate uh, situation in many cases but the one thing that we do lose in that is that we're in the adversarial system we do have a little bit of a check and a balance because these forensic scientists are working for opposing sides and checking one another's opinions if there's a single forensic scientist working we don't have that second opinion that tries to keep the balance so there are some pro uh, benefits and some disadvantages for using these two forensic scientists or a single forensic scientist. This distinction of an adversarial system versus an inquisitorial system may make it seem as if the inquisitorial system avoids conflict, whereas the adversarial system uh, promotes conflict. But you should keep in mind that in a legal matter, there are always parties that are in conflict with one another. If you are thinking about someone who committed a murder, so someone is accused of committing the murder, then the question is still whether that person is innocent or guilty. And... Uh, some uh, evidence will point towards the innocence and some will point towards the guilt of the person and that inherent conflict cannot be avoided, whatever system you use. 
in another case where two people disagree about the terms of a contract into which they entered previously. They again have this disagreement and it is a conflict and it has to be settled. Whether we are talking about an adversarial system or an inquisitorial system, there is conflict that needs to be resolved. So don't think that inquisitorial systems avoid conflict. They just approach conflict in a different way. But now that we've mentioned uh, the example of murder and a contract, there's another distinction that we should look at. And that is the notion of a civil case versus a criminal case. A civil case is when two parties, typically two civilians, litigate against one another. We mentioned the example of a contract. They entered into a contract, they agreed about the terms of the contract, but as time goes by, it turns out that they understood things differently and now the court has to decide who is right or who is wrong. Or the two parties entered into a contract and the one party did not meet its obligations in terms of the contract and the other party wants some remedy. They want to sue the defaulting party for money or for some reparation and again they uh, enter into a civil case, they open civil litigation such that the court can decide whether this party who defaulted should indeed pay some uh, money to the other party and often also the amount that should be paid. In a criminal case like murder it is typically the state who is one party to the legal case and the accused is the other party to this legal case. Uh, we were talking about the state, different terms may be used in some jurisdictions, they will talk about the state, in some they will talk about the people, in some they will talk about the crown, but it doesn't matter what term we use really. Uh, in general, some person who, at least in my jurisdiction, works as a prosecutor, represents the state or the government or the people or perhaps the crown. And then the accused is represented by a lawyer or an attorney or an advocate who tries to either show that the person is innocent or show that there are factors that should be taken into account which may mean that the person is not as guilty, that there are mitigating circumstances. One of the critical differences between these two cases is the following. A civil case usually is decided on the balance of probability. In other words, the judge or whoever hears the case has to decide who has the better case. In statistical terms, even though we shouldn't use statistical terms here, uh, the one who scores a li little bit higher than the other one. Uh, we shouldn't assign numbers, but if the one party gets a 55 and the other party gets a 45, then the 55% party wins. In a criminal case, uh, the accused is usually assumed to be innocent until proven guilty. And that until proven guilty means that the party has to be shown to be guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. So uh, there should, in practice, be no question about whether this person is indeed guilty. Again, people who play with numbers will say something like 95% certainty, but uh, again, those who study statistics will know that that uh, doesn't make sense. You cannot assign numbers like that you should, in essence, know that this person is guilty before you can convict the person in a criminal case. We just made a distinction between civil and criminal proceedings. Unfortunately, the term civil is overloaded because we will encounter it with a very different meaning in the next topic that we're going to discuss. And this next topic 
is the difference between common law systems and civil law systems. In a civil law system, where we use civil in this letter with its letter meaning, the law is codified. In other words, the law is written out as a set of rules. The very first codes, legal codes, were simply lists of crimes and punishments. If you steal something, then you have to pay that much. If you kill somebody, then you have to pay that much. Well, actually, if you kill a person of noble birth, then you have to pay that much. And if you kill a commoner, then you have to pay that much. But it was, as I said, just a system or just a list of crimes and punishments. But those codes developed and they, on, a, on an abstract level, began to spell out how legal disputes should be settled. This almost took the form of a program, or perhaps a set of programs. More specifically for us as computer scientists, it works like a generic program. It abstracts away from the details, and it says, if you want to uh, consider a case that fits this pattern, then these are the steps you have to follow to reach your conclusion. What you will find in a civil setting like this is that the judge will typically be very, very active. The judge will ask questions all the time. It's not like your typical adversarial system where the judge sits and listens. Here the judge executes the program and reaches the conclusion. We are comparing civil jurisdictions with common law jurisdictions at the moment. In a common law jurisdiction, the law is not written down in this recipe-like fashion. In fact, the idea of a common law system is that cases should be decided consistently. So if a case is being decided in a certain way, then subsequent cases have to be decided in the same way. So the first time that a court is faced with a specific question, it has to somehow make up its mind and decide the case. And that sets a legal precedent. It forms what is known as case law. And then suddenly we have a law that was not enacted by parliament or some other legislative body. Uh, we have a law that stems from a decision made by a judge. And other courts then have to follow this same law, the case law, and decide the case in the same manner. We have to elaborate a little bit on this point because courts usually operate at various levels. Uh, you may have your local courts uh, that uh, hear very common cases, you may have, and typically these are the lower courts or even courts, in quotes, below the lower courts. And then you have your high courts, and you may have your courts of appeal and even constitutional or other top-level courts. Generally, if a high court decides a case, then the lower courts have to follow that precedent, but other courts on the same level do not have to consider it as a precedent. However, once such a case has gone to a court of appeal, whatever the court of appeal decides applies to the high courts that are below it. And if there is an even higher court, if that court makes a decision, then whatever that court has decided has to be followed by the other courts. So case law typically set by higher courts and apply to lower courts. And the decisions that are made in the lower courts are typically not case setting. They don't create precedents. They are heard independently. Uh, they have to apply case law where uh, case law is available, but they do not set, they do not make 
case law. To illustrate this point, we had a very interesting situation in South Africa a while ago. Many years ago, our higher court decided that euthanasia, assisted suicide, was illegal. So whenever anyone wanted to use euthanasia, it would have been illegal based on the high court's decision. More recently, a person approached the high court and asked to be euthanized. The high court noted that euthanasia in South Africa was illegal according to case law. However, it also noted the introduction of the importance of dignity according to the Bill of Rights introduced in the new South African Constitution and deemed that dignity was more important in this situation than the existing case law. Two hours before the judgment was delivered, the applicant passed away. The High Court granted this person's wish of being euthanized. Now, since the person was already dead, he did not uh, make a difference in the end. Euthanasia could not be applied. However, we now have this rather interesting situation where a High Court said we should revisit euthanasia but case law said it is illegal, and the only way to really settle this matter would be for the state to appeal the case that uh, against the person who applied for euthanasia, even though the person is already dead, so that it can go to a court of appeals and eventually go to the constitutional court, so that we can have case law that is not contradictory. The case was indeed appealed, and in 2016, the Supreme Court of Appeals found that that particular case was not a suitable one for development of assisted suicide or euthanasia, and therefore reversed the decision of the Court of First Instance. And all of these cases when you have a president or whatever, uh, it is possible for parliament or the other legislative body to enact a statute. And once a statute or an act of parliament uh, is on the books, then that will override case law. The court may still find that that law that has been enacted is not aligned with the constitution and overturn it. But in, as a general rule, once a statute is on the books or an act has been signed by the president, that would overrule any case law. And also in the case of an inquisitorial or codified legal system, uh, a specific act will override the general rules that occur in the code. The next aspect of legal systems that we need to consider is who makes the final decision. So if it is a civil matter, the question is literally who wins the case. Is it the claimant or is it the defendant? In a criminal matter, the question in the end is whether the accused is found guilty or not. And then along with those, what would the punishment be? Or in a civil case, what would the remedy be? In essence, two options. The one option is that the judge makes this decision, or the other option is that a jury makes this decision. In some countries, uh, the right to be, uh, go, or the right to go on trial and be judged by a jury of your peers is deemed to be an essential element of human rights. In other countries, the judge simply makes the decision and there is no notion of a jury. In fact, where juries are used, it is possible in some cases to ask for a bench trial where the judge then makes this decision. The reason why this is important in our context is the following. Your audience makes a difference 
to the way in which you present forensic evidence. If you are presenting forensic evidence to a judge, then the judge is a learned scholar. The judge may not know much about your specific field of expertise, but the judge can probably ask for assistance outside of court and uh, determine what the weight of your evidence should be. However, a jury consisting of lay people may be impressed by all sorts of bells and whistles and uh, as a forensic scientist you may want to play to that audience to make them understand the message that you want to convey. Hopefully it's the same message that you, can, that you are conveying to whether it is a judge or a jury, but the way in which you convey it may need to be adapted for the audience. This also has another profound impact on evidence. That deals with admissibility of evidence. In the end, it is a court that decides whether evidence will be admitted or not. There are all sorts of crazy theories that people bring to court and then a court has to decide whether they're going to allow that theory as evidence or not. One of the best known examples uh, that to this day remains disputed is the so-called lie detector. Now, if you are using a jury system and uh, you have wired up a person to this fancy machine that is called the lie detector and the lie detector says that this person has lied, it becomes very hard for the opposing side to discredit this evidence. So before this lie detector testimony or evidence is even allowed into court, the other party will object or may object and uh, the jury will typically be taken out of the courtroom and then the parties will fight about the admissibility of this evidence. However, if it's only a judge presiding or a bench of judges deciding, they are deemed to be almost superhuman in a sense. They are able to, at least in principle, forget something that they've seen. So if you present a theory to them and then the other party discredits that theory entirely, the judge can say, okay, I buy the argument by the opposing side that this theory is indeed crazy and I'm not going to really consider it. A judge has to consider all evidence, but the judge can attach a very low weight to this discredited theory. So what you will see in some jurisdictions, let's say United States, there are rather specific rules that determine the admissibility of evidence. In fact, in the United States, there are these two very well-known standards, the Fry standard, and the Fry standard, as an aside, deals with admissibility of lie detector evidence, and then the Daubert standard. The Daubert standard is one that came about later. It is used by all or for all federal cases where scientific evidence is to be introduced, and it is used by about half of the states in the United States. So these set requirements that evidence have to meet before the jury will be allowed to hear them. In other jurisdictions where a judge listens to the case, the judge can simply say, I will listen to this and uh, perhaps forget it. Again, we have a rather interesting example from South Africa. Uh, in a certain case, it was a case in a magistrate court, so a lower court, uh, the events were as follows. A person, this happened to be a judge, but this has no impact on the case, uh, this person was driving while under the influence of alcohol. He crashed through someone's garden wall, 
and the person who owned that property started recording this judge's speech. And clearly this judge was under the influence. Uh, during the trial, the state wanted to introduce this evidence that was recorded on the cell phone. It was recorded as a video, but the cell phone was pointed away. So it was, in essence, a voice recording. What happened uh, in the meantime was that after the evidence was recorded on the cell phone, it was handed to, by that person who recorded it to his lawyer. This lawyer handed it to another lawyer. Uh, they wrote it at some stage to a CD that was handed from person to person. The original cell phone was stolen, so there was no chain of custody that was followed. If you know anything about digital forensics, then you know that this chain of custody is deemed to be very, very important. In fact, it is probably accepted as a standard uh, position of departure that with such digital evidence, you have to image that uh, evidence immediately and calculate a digest for it. So the defense in this matter, in the magistrate court, brought uh, witnesses who all testified to this best practice standard. The magistrate in the case, Magistrate Nair, listened to all these arguments and then basically said, let's listen to this video and then I will decide afterwards. So this magistrate effectively said, show me the evidence and if, uh, if it's useful, I'll use it. If it's not useful, I will forget about it. I will discard it. So he did not at that stage decide whether he would admit the evidence or not, but he decided that he would listen to the evidence. In the end, uh, he said that the video evidence contained nothing new nothing that was not said by witnesses during oral evidence. However, he deemed this video to be very, very useful in the sense that where witnesses said that the accused spoke in a certain manner, that his speech was slurred, he could hear from the video what they meant by that. So it illustrated what eyewitnesses already said, and because it didn't add anything new, but just uh, uh, provided more detail of evidence already provided, he decided to admit that case. Now, if he had a jury there, there was no way in which you could let the jury listen to this video and then afterwards tell the, uh, the jury, forget what you've heard. So there is this nice distinction between the two. There's also a, a debate going on on the selection of juries and the impact that that has on how cases are decided. In my own country, South Africa, a jury system was used until the 1960s. In fact, uh, it was officially abolished in the 1960s, but uh, it was last used more than a decade before it was scrapped. On the screen at the moment is a picture of the Palace of Justice, more or less on Church Square in the center of Pretoria. And one of the interesting aspects of this court is that it still has a box where the jurors can sit. Very, very few courts in South Africa has a place for a jury to sit, uh, it's been abolished so long ago that it has no physical presence in most South African courts even. One of the questions we have to look at is where does a legal system at a specific point on earth originate? And the answer is it probably originated somewhere between a thousand and a hundred years ago and it was probably the legal system of whoever governed that area during that period. 
obviously this means colonialism is back on the map and your legal system probably has colonial origins but it's a good question what else could be an option there are only so many legal systems that survived and in a sense they're all colonial in the early days very few legal systems were written down to some extent one can even think about the law of nature where everybody fought for their own existence and where they had to agree on some bigger law to uh, help society to to move forward some of the codes that were indeed written down were very local as we noted earlier many of them basically was a list of crimes and punishments but one of the most significant changes happened in the roman empire the roman empire expanded and uh, included most of north africa and europe and uh, a legal system was necessary to govern this wide expanse of earth the roman empire was managed from rome and uh, they developed this coded system so it was a civil system with an inquisitorial uh, approach problem is the empire was so big that a couple of codes were developed and they were not all consistent so it made a difference when and where your case was heard in about the year 300 constantine moved the empire's headquarters from rome to a city called byzantium byzantium was renamed to constantine so it became known as constantinople and constantinople was renamed in later years to become present-day istanbul Constantinople is interesting in the sense that it's the only major city in the world that is located on two continents. Part of it is located in Europe and part of it is located in Asia. Uh, when Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople, the Western Empire, in essence Roman North Africa, were further away from the Roman headquarters and it started to fall to barbarian invasions. Germanic peoples and other peoples who moved in from the north and also moved around in Europe and in Africa. And as they moved in, they brought their own traditional legal systems, typically not very well developed systems, but they also had some exposure to the Roman systems that were in place where they were located in the Roman Empire at earlier times. And they took these legal systems along with them and they basically had systems that were a combination of old Roman law and the local customs, not very well developed, not very sophisticated and, uh, well, if what you are doing is uh, farming and hunting a little bit then such a legal system is probably fine and they didn't bother too much on the other hand the eastern uh, roman empire flourished and they elected to, uh, other emperors one after the other and in about the year 500 justinianus came to pi uh, power Justinian is one, or in a slightly more English form, Justinian the first, and uh, he immediately realized that the Roman legal system needed to be reformed. So he set about and created, or had his uh, scholars create something that was known as the Corpus Juris Civilis. So the corpus, the body of civil law, a 
civil law in the sense of a codified law. So this was this contained a legal code, and it, it attempted at the very least to sort out the differences that existed in the earlier Roman codes. Uh, this was a, a for, fairly big piece of work, but one of the most important parts of it was the Codex Decianianus, the codification of Roman law around the year 500. In the meantime, uh, the eastern part of the Roman Empire also weakened, and eventually, in about the year 1000, it did not exist in the form that it existed anymore, and about 300 years later, the Ottoman Empire took over. Ottoman Empire, when they took over, uh, Islamic law was introduced and Roman law no longer had a role to play. But back in history, just a little bit, around the year 1000, the Codex Justinianus was discovered in Italy, and the University of Bologna started to train uh, legal scholars. And they used this uh, Codex Justinianus as their textbook. So this recall, this was almost the ultimate Roman law. This took everything into account that happened in earlier in Roman times, consolidated it all, and suddenly you had these legal scholars, let's call them lawyers, who were trained in a sophisticated legal system, and they started moving away from Italy along the Mediterranean to the west. So in what we now know as France and also obviously Italy, and further to the west, uh, Spain, Portugal, all of those Mediterranean countries got lawyers who were trained in Bologna. In the northern parts, basically where the Netherlands and Germany and those countries are, their old legal systems no longer sufficed. And they started using these lawyers who were available in the south of, of uh, Europe. And these lawyers migrated north and they introduced uh, much more of the Roman system into the northern countries. So what happened in a country like the Netherlands, for example, the Dutch law was augmented by Roman law as taught in Bologna to the extent that the Dutch law became the smaller part of the law and the legal system used in the Netherlands was known as Roman Dutch law. Similar things happened in other countries in Europe where they mixed their traditional legal systems with this Roman law and uh, life could continue. However, when the Ottoman Empire came into existence, there was another problem. For many centuries, peoples from Europe and North Africa obtained their silk from China and their spices from India. Now, to get from those Mediterranean countries to India was rather simple. You would get onto a boat and sail across the Mediterranean, and then where the Suez Canal exists today, you would simply go overland and you would get into the Red Sea, and then you could sail to India. No problem. Silk was a bit more of a problem uh, because you had to travel quite a distance from Europe to China across the desert. But again, the traders uh, for millennia used the silk route to carry silk from China towards Europe. But when the Ottoman Empire came into existence, this route was no longer available. The Ottomans reigned over Istanbul or Byzantium or Constantinople, depending at the time period at which you look. This created a problem. Just imagine if you can't get your silks, and more importantly, if you can't get your spices. What do you do? Well, you start and try and find it using other means. And to try and go uh, 
past the Ottoman Empire to the north was a bit of a problem. The satellite image that we're using was taken in January, so the ice at the top prevented you from using that route. In January, it's winter in the northern hemisphere, but even in June, the ice only recedes a little bit, and it's still a very hard way to travel to, to get there. Another option in the year 1500, more or less, was to believe more or less what Galileo Galilei said and try and sail in the other direction, sail away from India. And if the earth were indeed round, then you would eventually reach China and India. And, and this is what the Spanish did. The Portuguese decided to try and go south. Now, if you go south, then your first problem is that Africa is on the south. And the immediate territory uh, to the south of the Ottoman Empire is the Sahara Desert. Not the easiest place to cross. And as you move down Africa, wherever you are, Africa is not the easiest place to cross. Except when you get to the tip of Africa and you sail around Africa, then it's fairly easy to sail towards, uh, towards India. So this is what they did. Portuguese first came. Uh, they touched countries like Mozambique and uh, Angola. Obviously, at, those th uh, well, at that time, Mozambique and Angola were not known as Mozambique and Angola. They also touched uh, Brazil, which was not known as Brazil at the time. They needed some place to stop to get refreshments, uh, to get fresh water, and uh, these are the places they selected. Once around the Cape, they sailed to a city named Goa in India. And it's one thing to, to sail, but uh, after a while they started saying, we want to control more of that area. And they created established colonies in those areas. And as they established colonies, they introduced their religion into those areas. But more importantly for our purposes, they also introduced their legal systems into those areas. In fact, to this day, if you visit the city of Goa in India, you will find that it looks like a Portuguese city and you will find Roman Catholicism. After the Portuguese started trading with China using this route, the Dutch followed. And uh, as you are probably aware, they established a halfway point at Cape Town, not known as Cape Town at this point, but they called the area the Cape Colony, and uh, went on and they traded with uh, India in the same way that the Portuguese did. This trading post, or halfway point in the Cape Colony, that was initially more or less a castle and some vegetable gardens, expanded and became a colony. And the legal system that they introduced there was obviously the Roman Dutch legal system. The next big shipping country was Great Britain. And Great Britain started sailing around the Cape. And at some stage they said, we rather like this Cape colony, we're going to take it over. They fought the Dutch and in 1795 they captured the Cape colony in the year 1800. They decided uh, that they really liked the Dutch uh, at that point and they gave it back to the Dutch. And five years later they decided that they disliked the Dutch and they fought another battle and they took over the Cape Colony yet again. But as they took over the Cape Colony, they said, we have a working legal system here, let's continue to use it, the Dutch-Roman system. But they also said this inquisitorial system is very slow and painful. We're going to replace it with our own system. And we'll say something more about that in a moment or two. Before talking further about what happened in these colonies, 
we have to go back to Europe and consider what happened in Europe in the meantime. The French had their revolution, they turned the French kingdom into a republic, and a very enthusiastic young man fought in that uh, revolution. In fact, not only enthusiastic, but very, very ambitious. Person was Napoleon Bonaparte. At around uh, the year 1800, he started to try and conquer Europe. But before he started conquering Europe, he developed his own legal code, a code that was influenced by the Roman code, but was also very different from the Roman code. And this code became known as the Napoleonic Code. So from 1800 to 1815, he fought his way across Europe and conquered one country after the other. And as he conquered them, he replaced their legal systems by the Napoleonic Code. Codified legal system, a civil legal system, an inquisitorial legal system, and in all of those countries, France, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, he, in, he instituted this new code and uh, captured most of Europe and they were running with the Napoleonic code. Obviously, as you know, he never reached England. At Waterloo in Belgium, he was defeated by the British. He was sent to St. Helena, where he spent his last days. So what we had at this stage was a Europe that used the Napoleonic Code. But while they were using the Napoleonic Code, they didn't change it in their colonies. So in South Africa, which at that point uh, was at one point a British colony and at another point a Dutch colony, kept on using the Roman Dutch legal system. In England and Wales, a common law system was used. This was an adversarial system, no codification. And uh, the change that they introduced in the Cape earlier was to make it more adversarial, to uh, take the in inquisitorial process away, replace it with their own process. So suddenly South Africa had a mixed system. It wasn't quite a common law country, but case law did apply. It wasn't quite a codified country, but the Roman code was used. Um, and, and it all turned out into a rather interesting mix of legal systems, a rather unique mix of legal systems. And, and uh, Roman Dutch law was extended because the colonies of Britain in the area were joined together, so it was extended to the neighboring countries at the time, uh, British colonies, countries that now are known as Botswana and uh, Swaziland or Iswatini, uh, Lesotho, um, uh, Zimbabwe, and so on. So what you have here at the southern tip of Africa is a cluster of countries that use the Dutch Roman law. Just to the north, where the Portuguese colonies were, the Napoleonic code is used uh, with an inquisitorial approach and a codified legal system. If you go further a bit more, you get to countries like Kenya, that was a British colony, but never a Dutch colony, and therefore they use a common law system. In fact, uh, one of the rather interesting cases is if you go around the Cape towards India and you reach uh, Indonesia, then you will find that they use a Dutch-Roman system. Now, they became independent uh, just after the Second World War, and they introduced many of their own concepts there, but some of their most important legal texts are still written in Dutch. English weren't involved in, uh, in that country, uh, in particular in uh, Jakarta, 
that was known as Batavia at the time, and that is located on the island of Java. The Portuguese, as an aside, went further towards uh, China, and they took the Chinese island Macau and converted it to a colony. And Macau became Portuguese-speaking, using a codified legal system based on the Napoleonic Code. Um, the British captured Hong Kong, and they introduced a common law system, the adversarial system. Mainland China introduced a legal system that was loosely based on the Napoleonic Code, but uh, just loosely. It, it's not uh, an extension of the Napoleonic Code. So mainland China uses a codified legal system, uh, one that uses as an inquisitorial system. So in that one country, China, three legal systems are in use. A codified legal system in mainland China, a different codified system in Macau, and a common law system in Hong Kong. The French sailed towards the, uh, what is now known as the United States, and one of the colonies turned out to be called Louisiana. Louisiana adopted a codified legal system, but then became part of the larger United States. So, in the state Louisiana, a codified legal system is still used for state cases. But if you go to the federal level, then a common law system is used, because the United States, as a union, adopted the British common law system. In Canada, the French governed over Quebec, and introduced a common law system, or rather introduced a codified legal system based on the Napoleonic Code. But when Canada was formed, a common law system was introduced over Canada. Uh, South America used the legal system that they obtained from Spain, and in essence the Napoleonic system with local changes. So. Long story short, the world is a very, very strange place with legal systems and the remnants of legal systems spread all over the world without any logic unless you look at the history. And those legal systems also started changing the moment they were incorporated with other national systems and local systems. So in some cases, basically all cases, where you have multiple legal systems in a single country, those legal systems are moving closer together, although they are still fundamentally different. One way of, in a sense, visualizing how these systems can be integrated, uh, can be obtained by watching a little bit of Judge Judy. Judge Judy is based in the United States, she uses a, a common law system, but her style of uh, handling court matters is clearly inquisitorial. Let's watch. All parties on Hill versus Griffin. Step forward, please. 27-year-old singer Robert Hill is suing his girlfriend's friend, 36-year-old professional driver Janet Griffin, for sending a computer virus to him, destroying his computer. Janet says she didn't know it was dangerous. Mr. Hill, this case has to do with your computer. Yes, ma'am. And we're gonna learn something today about computer viruses because I know nothing about computer viruses. So you're gonna to explain to me how Ms. Griffin's conduct impacted on your computer. Let's go back a little bit. You put on your computer. Mm -hmm. You're sitting there starting to do work, and then you say, I'm going to see if I've got mail. Right. And that's what you did. You said, do I have mail? And you got a piece of mail from Miss Griffin. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. So what did you do when it says you've got mail? I read it, and... You it, hope, and what did it say? It said, he, 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 very funny, and then it said, you had this one coming. And so there's an attachment that was there, which is a, like what? a... What's an attachment? An attachment is a program. It could be either photos, jokes, anything 
music, anything that you can process okay. off. But it's of not the really an attachment that you can hold and hold right. on to. It's on the machine. You click it onto the machine, and it does a number, any number of different things. It, okay. And what was the attachment? What did the attachment say? The attachment was a program which executed and appeared to take all of my personal files. It would be just like a file cabinet with all the information saved for years catching fire and that's it, it's gone. That's basically what this file appeared to do. You thought that it was going to delete everything. So what did you do? After that, I started calling people to ask them what I should do. Immediately they said, make sure the system's off. Don't start the system again. After conversation with people, what you did was you turned your whole system down. I turned it down. For how long? It ended up being more than a week. I had it off because I had to back up everything. I had to go through the entire system. It cost me a week's worth of time. It cost me money for all of the programs, for all of the different things. I've got receipts for the amounts of any of the antivirus programs, the CDs, CD writers, backing up the system. How much were all those bills? Basically, everything was, in my total, $641.33. Can I just take a look at those, please? Did there come a time when you found out that this was a joke? At this point, Your Honor, I, I've been told by, by Janet herself that this was a joke. Okay. Yes. Um, basically, I sent this joke out to approximately five, six people. I've had people off the street asking me to send it to them. I've had people email me asking you to send it. The program Just in question... Second. So you had people asking you to send it, and did you? Yes, I have. He didn't ask you to send it. Sure. No. Right? How many times previous to this did you send Mr. Hill an email? None. I had only just bought my comp computer about two weeks before at both his and his girlfriend's insistence that I needed to get on the internet and start sending funny email to everybody. When I got a joke, I was supposed to pass it along. Miss <laughs> Griffin, I don't buy it. Okay, Miss Griffin, so pay careful attention. You just said to me, you didn't know him well enough to know what he would think. That's the way you started out. Right then you don't send somebody something if you don't know who they are and you don't know how they would react to a joke that might lead a person to believe that their computer is going to be or whatever information that's in their computer is going to be destroyed even for a minute and if you do do that you're responsible for the consequences if you stand outside a crowded movie theater and shout fire and everybody comes running out of the movie theater and a couple of people get stomped in the process. You can't, if you're arrested, claim First Amendment privileges. You know, I have a right to scream fire. Well, you may have a right to scream fire, but all the people that were injured as a result of what you did, you are responsible for, even though it was a joke. Well, this is true. I'm good. Here. Judgment for the plaintiff in the amount of six hundred and forty-one dollars and thirty-three cents. Thank, Thank you, Your Honor. You may step out. There are some remarks that need to be made about this clip. It is interesting how Judge Judy talks about the example of shouting fire, and then uh, uses that as an analogy to talk about the software, probably a joke that has been emailed to the recipient of this email. This is typical in common law jurisdictions where one uh, argues from certain known laws to an unknown situation. Here, Judge Judy is clearly uninformed about computer viruses, but she appreciates the effect. Secondly, uh, one can see how Judge Judy asks questions and gets responses, typical of an inquisitorial system. Uh, she's been briefed beforehand by receiving half a page of written statements from both parties, so the documentation that she talks about is not extensive. What she learns about the case, she learns in this court of law. Now, technically, this is also not a court of law. This is a reality TV show and really falls under the umbrella of arbitration systems. 
So she really functions as an arbitrator, not a judge, and it has been adapted into this format in order to work for a TV audience. One should also note that some of the material has been edited out before the show has aired. The excerpt that I showed you was further edited to only focus on some of the most important aspects of the process. With the internet, cases will be often span jurisdictions. You may deal with a case in South Africa but email service may be hosted in the United States. Or you may deal with a system that uh, has multiple copies, uh, extensions throughout the world. So it becomes rather hard to just think in terms of your local legal system. Now going back to our initial remarks, ideally, your, your approach to forensic science should be agnostic of the legal system in use. You should speak the scientific truth. But as we said, there are all sorts of things to keep in mind. The audience that you are playing to, is the jury or is the judge? And also, how do the various laws uh, impact on one another? Uh, with case law developing in different countries at the, in different manners, the local case law may be very different from the country in which you want to uh, look at the matter. So the bottom line is the le legal field is a minefield and you definitely need good legal advice to deal with any case that crosses jurisdictional boundaries. Mm -hmm.